Good morning, and uh, we want you to know that this is a great Sabbath and that you are so welcome to be with us. And we're grateful that you've come back to our website and are looking again for the sermon that is here. If you've responded to the email that I've sent out uh, concerning the fact that this morning we had a little bit of a glitch. Well, actually, it was more like a meltdown. Uh, our uh, server and or our computers and the programs on them uh, did not act correctly. We have been looking at what has been going on. So what you're seeing today is a sermon that, that uh, I did earlier today and I'm doing again and I'm very happy to be doing it again because we have the capabilities, but uh, unfortunately you won't get to hear the great music that we did as well. And I want to thank Eric for putting that together for us. But as we begin with the Word of God today here on this Sabbath in May, let us pray. Father God, we are grateful that no matter what the circumstances, you already know what we need. And we're grateful that we can record this again because this is something that comes from your Word that is timeless and that is going to give us encouragement in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you so much for the message that uh, you love us that you want to bring us back together with you and that you're interested in everyone. We love you and we're looking forward to this. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I'm, I'm very excited about what I want to share and, and I'm, I'm grateful to be doing this uh, as a second part of a two-part series. You can go back and, and look at the, the previous one from last week. The, under His Wings is the title, and the, the fact is that we start in Luke chapter 7 today with another story. Last week was the story of Ruth, and um, you can go back and, and look at that, and I may refer to it in a moment, but what has, what has really grabbed a hold of me is what Luke does with a progression in Luke chapter 7, 8, and 9. There's a story at the end of chapter 8 that we're going to look at particularly, but the build-up to that story, and then what happens at the beginning of chapter 9, is what I really want you to catch this morning. Uh, it's very important, I believe, because the fact is, here we are in the midst of COVID, here we are in the midst of this pandemic, and uh, we're all asking ourselves, what is it that God wants from us? What is it that God needs from us? And as I read this, it, it, it just struck me that having read these stories so many times before, here it is again that God is speaking to us and telling us why Jesus came, what his message was, and then what he would like us to do about it as his disciples in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic. So if you open your Bibles with me or look, up, look at your phone, uh, just turn to Luke chapter 7, and right away we begin with a very interesting story. Now, in this progression, we're going to be seeing a number of stories, and this one is kind of the one that sets the stage for the series of stories that we're going to go through. Number one is the centurion. He's not just any centurion. Number, uh, he, he is, he's a centurion who is loved by the people, not just the Roman people, but by the Jewish people. He's loved by them because in, in, in his way, in, in his joy of serving, he has actually become friends with the people that he is uh, there to enslave, you could say, or to uh, keep under control from a Roman perspective. But in the midst of that, he has decided that it's better to be friends and it's better to, to do good things for the people that he is in charge of, uh, of, of caring for. And so he has built them a synagogue. This is a striking uh, 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 finding that we have right here in the story. These people uh, are the people that he goes to when one of his valued slaves, one of his valued servants becomes ill. He goes and he asks his Jewish friends, ostensibly thinking they're the ones who will talk to their God, and he asks them, uh, 
if they would help him with the healing of his servant. Now you say, this is, this is just a story. Well, the fact is, it sets the stage for this progression that we're going to see. First of all, you have someone who is Jewish. You have the, the Jewish leaders. Second, then, you have somebody who's outside of the community, and there is a situation in which somebody is sick and they need to be healed. And you have the situation where the person who's outside of the community wants to come inside the community to find the healing and is, in, in, in fact, saying, I believe that your God is the God who can provide healing. The series that we're talking about is Under His Wings. But I, I, I want to just bring this up, uh, <laughs> and doing this uh, again, I get a, a chance to include some other things that I didn't include the first time. Uh, Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 tells us that the Son of Righteousness is rising with healing in His wings. Very important concept. Hold on to that because this is the first story that illustrates exactly that. Here you have the church people in Jesus' day being asked by somebody who is outside of the church, you are the ones we believe know the God who can bring healing. You are the ones who know the God that has healing in his wings. Now, would you please help me with my most valued servant? Well, this is Capernaum. This is what uh, Luke chapter 7 tells us. This is Capernaum, Jesus' base of operations. And so the Jewish leaders go to Jesus, whom they have seen do miracles before. They go to Jesus and they say, look, would you please do a miracle for this, this centurion? We know it's not the usual thing. We know that you're one of our teachers, our rabbis, and that you care for our people, but uh, 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 this, this guy's a good guy. He's a good guy. He, he built us a synagogue. Would you, please, would you please help us? Would you please go with us? So you, you have a picture of Jesus and these, these church people going off to the centurion's house when they are met by one of the centurion's other servants who comes with a message from the centurion. You do not need to come to my house. In fact, I am not worthy for you to come to my house. Please just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus turns to his friends, to his fellow church people, and says, I have not found faith like this in all of Israel. Is, is Jesus doing a put down on, on, on is, Israel? I, I hope not. But at the same time, it feels like that. Because here you have somebody who shouldn't necessarily know because they're not part of the inside. And he's talking to the people who are in the inside. And he is saying, you should have this kind of faith that I'm seeing from this person from the outside. Keep that sort of two-sided piece in your mind because you're going to see it again and again and again in the stories as we go through here because look what happens in the very next story. Jesus is now traveling along with his disciples and he goes past the village of Nain. And as he's going past the village of Nain with his disciples, a large crowd is coming out of the town. Now what are they, what are they doing? It's a funeral procession. In this moment, another picture is being painted. And again, we know that the disciples, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they each painted their own picture. Luke is painting this picture, and he is saying, here's, here's another thing that happened, and here's the situation. What is the situation? It's a funeral. Jesus has just healed the centurion's servant. Now he is walking past Nain and the people are coming out with a funeral. Who has died? Well, it's an only son. It's an only son of a woman who all she has in the world is her son. My friends, please understand that your connection in biblical times to the community, your attachment to the community came through the man. 
So what you have here is not just a, a funeral for the young man who has died, but you have a mother who is now going to be disconnected from the community because her son has died. So again, the pattern that we are watching for is happening again in this story. You have a group of people, and in that group are people who are connected, and in that group are people who are disconnected. And Jesus comes along. God comes along. And by resurrecting the young man and giving him back to his mother... He effectively reconnects his mother with the society, with the church people, with the traditions. Last week, we, we talked about the book of Ruth, and this comes to mind again right now because it is this reconnection process that Ruth was involved with when she took her mother-in-law's advice and went and uncovered, <laughs> this is very intimate, uh, uncovered Boaz's feet while he's lying next to his mound of barley grain after the harvest. He's sleeping there to protect it. She uncovers his feet and lies down only to, to, to wake him up so that when he wakes up, she can say to him, would you please cover me with your cloak? Would you cover me with your shawl? Would you cover me with your wings? This word for tefillim or, or for the tzitzot that you see with, with Orthodox Jewish people, the, the tassels that, that come down. This idea is the same idea as the word wings. And as Chris and I have gone over this, as we've uh, batted it back and forth, it has become this, this illuminating concept. And so here we are uh, sharing the idea of under his wings. So you have Ruth, last week we talked about Ruth, she is basically saying to Boaz, I would like you to cover me with your wings. I want to be in your family. I want you to be the one who brings me back under your wings. And so again, we see Jesus in these stories that are leading up to the end of chapter 8, wait for it, <laughs> That every time he interacts with these individuals, what is he doing? He is extending the family of God, extending the wings, as it were, over the top of these individuals and bringing them in. It is the centurion that surprises him because he, he, he is not supposed to know these concepts, but he knows them and he appreciates them and he accepts that Jesus is the one who is capable of doing this. And that's why Jesus says, I haven't found this kind of understanding. I haven't found this kind of trust and faith in what God wants to see happen in all of Israel by comparison with the centurion. We move on, we move on, and we see that, that we, we have a, a section here that, that talks about uh, Jesus' interaction with his cousin John. What is happening here is that Jesus is coming along now as the Messiah, and he is displacing, in many respects, the, 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 the liking of the people. You think of popularity on on Facebook, uh, or, or some, some of the other uh, Instagram, let's say, and, and people want you to like their stuff, and, and people decide that they can actually monetize their site if they get enough people to like it. And, and so the more people that you can drive traffic to your site, therefore, uh, the more popular the, there you are, and therefore the advertisers say, okay, let's put money to this person because so many people are noticing them. Well, maybe in a very old-fashioned way, the same thing was happening with 
John's disciples. But Jesus turns, he turns things around, he turns things around, and he says to them in verse 31 of Luke chapter 7, to what can I compare the people of this generation? Now, he's talking to, to his, his own people. How can I describe them? He says, they're like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends, hey, hey, we played wedding songs, and you didn't dance. We played funeral songs, and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist didn't spend his time, he's now commenting about his cousin, didn't spend time eating bread or drinking wine, and you say, he's possessed of a demon. The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. Jesus is pointing to the fact that John is the one who is to be the forerunner. John is the one who was to come and to announce the Messiah. And even when he did, they would not listen to him. Even when he played them, to, told them about the, the great wedding feast in the sky, they wouldn't listen. Even when he told them that their sins and the way that they were going would cause them to be separated from God, they were not listening. John is kind of like us in many respects. Uh, uh, we, we look at ourselves as giving an end time message. It's a similar message that John was giving. Hey, the, the Messiah is coming. That's why we call ourselves Adventists. The, the Lord God is coming again, the second time. Hey, are you ready? Uh, do, do you have a relationship with him? In, in essence, we're, we're playing these songs. We're, we're, we're singing to people and asking them, are you willing to come and, and, and dance the wedding dance with us, with the God of heaven? Are, are, are you... Are you are you willing to understand that, that if you don't, there is going to be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, and it seems that people think we're crazy? Amazingly, they thought that instead of being from God, John was possessed by a demon. Here in the midst of COVID, I think that we are all very aware that there is so much information flowing around that we're all getting very tired of it. I'm just saying that in this moment, we have the opportunity to refocus, my friends. We have the opportunity to listen to people like the, uh, John the Baptist who were pointing to Jesus and saying, he's coming, he's coming. I'm not the one. I'm not the one. But he's coming. My friends, we have the opportunity to be giving that same message, and it is, it is more relevant today. It is more relevant today to be getting people to refocus their eyes, refocus their lives, refocus their values on Jesus than ever before. I would say ever before in my lifetime or in my ministry. If you have people like the synagogue people in, in Capernaum who are coming to you, who are watching you maybe, and are, are hoping that you will have the answer because you serve the God of creation, then I'm going to say myself, I want to make sure that I know that God. I know who that God is and that I know that it's not me, that I am the one who has been asked to prepare the way, along with a whole people who are giving a message that Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? And yes, there are people out there who believe that if you are talking about a fiery end to this world, you must be crazy. Nonetheless, nonetheless, we're okay with that, just like John was okay with it and just like Jesus was too. The story moves on. It moves on, and so must we. In, in verse 36, there's a dinner party, and Simon is the host. And Simon is a Pharisee, and he has all his Pharisee friends over. So again, we've got a church people type situation. And in the midst of this, uh, a lady who Simon knew, 
<laughs> in that very intimate sense, uh, 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 comes to the dinner party uninvited, but knows that Jesus is going to be there and has great respect for and love for Jesus and takes some of the, the earnings from her profession. Can you imagine that? Buys expensive perfume. Some, some Bible versions talk about it being a year's wages. And takes that perfume and breaks open the alabaster box in which the stone box in which it was housed and pours this perfume over Jesus' feet. And again, the scene is just amazing because for us, we're Westerners, we would think if Jesus was eating at a dinner party, he'd have his feet under the table. No, it's not. Jesus is on his side. His feet are out to the outside because the food is nearly on the floor, maybe on a slightly raised uh, small table, and he's able there to eat with the other guests. They're sitting either cross-legged or with their legs out to the side, and so she's able to come into maybe a dimly lit room, and she's able to pour this beautiful perfume over Jesus' feet, first unnoticed, and then as the perfume fills the room, and everybody knows that this is, this is the expensive stuff by the smell of it, they know that it's the really expensive stuff, suddenly Simon begins thinking, you know, if this guy knew what kind of woman this was, he, he wouldn't let her be doing what she's doing. And by this time, she has let her hair down. Now, we have this old, old saying, in, uh, you know, that, that, hey, why don't you just let your hair down? Well, what does that mean? It, it, it kind of means instead of being all buttoned up and, 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 and tucked away and, and in, you know, properly dressed and hair done and everything, why don't you just let it all hang out? Why don't you just let your hair down? Well, guess what? She had done this in the presence of Jesus, not to his face, but to his feet. This woman who is, has done things in her life that has separated her, she is considered a sinner. She is the one, not Simon, she is the one who is at his feet, wiping his feet, kissing his feet. And Simon has the audacity to question Jesus' validity as a prophet because he is allowing this woman to do this. Amazing, amazing. Again, I want you to see that you have those that are in and the one who is out and see how Jesus treats the one who is out. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said, said to Simon, he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, okay, let's stop right there. Her actions that have separated her from God, broken the relationship, her sins that are many, have been forgiven. And all the other Pharisees in the room and Simon are like, oh, who is this guy that he thinks that he can forgive sins and reconnect sinners to God? There's only one person they knew that could do this, and that was God himself. They weren't willing to go there in their minds. But that is exactly what Jesus was telling them when he was talking to them about the actions of this sinful lady in their minds. 
I tell you, her sins, though they are many, have been forgiven, so that she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. My friends, again, we see this, this dichotomy, this, this thing that Jesus is, is trying to get across to the church people, first of all, and then also to his disciples. He's trying to tell them, this is why I came. This is what the, the, the job of the Messiah is. It is, it is to tell the, uh, the whole world, not only those in, but also those out, that I have come to bring you back, to put you back into connection, literally to heal you back together with your heavenly Father. Let's go on. It's going. It, it, it's getting even more exciting. We see that there's a group of women in the first part of chapter eight. There's a group of women that follow Jesus, and just by looking at the list here, you see that they come from all walks of life. Not only street walkers, not only demon possessed, but also people uh, in Herod's palace. Very interesting that this little vignette comes to say, it's everybody that's invited. It's everybody that can come. And right away then, we get into the, uh, the two parables, the one, the parable of the seeds, and then the next, the parable of the lamp. And not wanting to go deep into those, I want to just draw one lesson out of this, and that is that in the lesson of the, of, of the seed, in order for there to be a multiplication in order for there to be more seeds, what is the one thing that has to happen? And this I think we, we skip over more because we try to talk about the type of soils that there are and all this and that and the other thing. But the, I think the main point of this entire story is that in the good soil where we're hoping most of the seed fell, the seed still has to die. The seed has to die in order for there to be multiplication. The rest of the story is simply that if the seed falls in ground that is not good in one way or another, it's not going to live in order to reproduce. In this again, we see that the, the reason that Jesus came was to die, was to give himself so that he could then be multiplied into the lives of many. And if you remember this, he, he talks, about, talks in, in large, large terms. So, uh, the, head, the heads of the grain, heads of the grain uh, not being less than 80 or 100. Okay. Then we go on to the parable of the lamp. No one lights a lamp, he says, and covers it up with a bowl or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where it lights, it, its light can be seen by all who enter the house. For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open. Church people, are you listening? You think you're better. You think that you are, are, are blessed by God. Well, the light has come into the world and... All that is secret. Simon, are you listening? Simon the Pharisee, are you listening? All that you are thinking, I'm going to tell you about because I know your thoughts. All that has been concealed will be brought to light and made known to everyone. So pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But to those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. What comes to mind right at this very moment is Nebuchadnezzar. Do you remember? Do you remember how he stood on his balcony that day and he looked over the beautiful city that he had overseen, the manufacture, the building of this, this city, and he said, look at this Babylon that I have built. 
taking all the credit, taking all the, 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 the adulation of the people for what he had done. And in that very moment, the Bible tells us, his intellect, his understanding was taken from him. I think that it's not uh, uh, by mistake that it was taken from him for seven years. Very important number in the Bible, as many of you know. He eats grass in a field like a cow for seven years. And then God gives him his intellect back. Amazing. He gives him his intellect back. He gives him his kingdom back. But there's a huge difference. And it's this difference that Jesus is talking about right here. When you listen to what I say, when you understand what I am saying about why I came at all, then you will know and you will be joyful about it. But if you turn your backs on it, even the little bit that you know, that you think you know, will be taken from you. Jesus is teaching. He's got lots of people around him. This is now Luke chapter 8, uh, verse 19. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get him get to him because of the crowd. So Jesus was told, your mother and brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. Now, normally speaking, <laughs> you know, when people are on a Zoom meeting or something like that and their phone rings beside them and they see that it's their mom uh, or it's their brothers, we may pause, we may put ourselves uh, on mute, and we may take the call because we are prioritizing our family. But in this instance, Jesus says something that is not like that. He, he, he completely blindsides people who think that he should prioritize his mother and his brothers over the people that he's teaching because they should be more important, right? But then he goes on and he says, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Again, this progression that we're seeing today is that Jesus is talking about those who are connected to him, those who understand him, those who realize, like the centurion, like the sinful woman who puts perfume on his feet, those who realize this are going to be the ones who are his brothers and sisters and mother. I just say, he who has ears, let him hear what Jesus is saying to us. The next, the next piece is very dramatic. In fact, both of them are, and they are the lead up to the story that I really, really wanted us to, to focus on today because of its connection to wings. Jesus is crossing the lake with his disciples. He's, he's going to go over to the other side of the lake. On the way, there is a storm. Now, some would say this is one of the storms that they went through. We just know that it was so bad that the disciples who had lived most of their lives on that lake fishing, knowing about the possibilities of bad storms on that lake, they knew that this was a storm that could potentially sink their boat and kill them. And so it is that they cry out, Master, Master, we're going to drown. We, your disciples cannot save ourselves. We are totally dependent on you. Do something if you wouldn't mind. Jesus stands up. He had been asleep in the back of the boat, as we know. He rebukes the winds and the raging waves, and the Bible says, suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. I would love to have seen that happen. Because you're talking about hardened fishermen who knew that storms just don't go away like this. You don't go from four or five foot swells to calm instantaneously. But that's what the Bible says happened. Then he asked them, where is your faith? 
So again, here we have this question. Here we have this situation with church people. In this case, his very disciples. And he is looking. He is looking for people who understand and believe in what he is and who he is and what he is trying to do, not only for the people that call themselves the people of God, but also for everyone and anyone. Where is your faith? Where is your understanding of the fact that I have been sent from God to be your Redeemer? Ruth, the book of Ruth, to be your Messiah. They get to the other side of the lake. The other side of the lake is the land of the Gerasenes, according to Luke. Jesus was climbing out of the boat. A man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time, he had been homeless, naked, and living in the tombs outside of the city. Now, some of you are thinking in your mind right away, oh, I've seen this guy. <laughs> I, I, I've, seen, I've seen homeless people like this. And, and I've got to admit, um, as Chris and I have looked at the problem that we have growing in, in our midst, in our society today, uh, we, we just look at each other oftentimes when we see people talking to themselves, when we see people twitching back and forth, walking along a sidewalk or walking uh, in, in the wash here in Santa Clarita. And we say, the crazies got them. However they got there, we don't know. But we do know that these are the skeletons, these are the husks of humanity that are now gone in one way or another, and, 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 and are talking to imaginary friends, are having imaginary conversations, are living a, an alternate reality. So my friends, this, this story particularly, as it leads up to the next story, is something that we as church people need to be taking very seriously because these people are still in our midst today. Now, the Bible calls this guy demon-possessed and that it wasn't just one, and it was, it was many. And according to, to what he said, he was speaking under the inspiration of these demons. Even though he had been placed under guard, the Bible says, put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded... Now he's talking to the man. What is your name? And they, they replied, Legion, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them to the bottomless pit. A very interesting piece to look at as we see this flow of stories unfold. The demons know who Jesus is. The question is, why didn't the church people why didn't the chosen people know and appreciate who he was? Why did they say that John the Baptist was demon-possessed? Why did they say that Jesus was a drunkard because he was willing to go and eat with people that the church had thrown out? This is, this is huge. This is massive. What is your name? My name is Legion. Do not send us to the bottomless pit. Basically, don't put us out of commission. Don't send us where we can never come back. They begged him to let them go into a herd of pigs. Now again, think of these, think of these stories as a way of Jesus trying to paint a very important picture to his disciples in their training phase to help them to understand who it is that he actually is and, and, and what he has come to do, what his message is. And so you see, you have the Gadarenes who are, are not part of the in crowd in the Decapolis, and they have pigs as their economy. They're pigs herds, and they have these pigs all together, and the demons ask if they can go into these pigs, which then rush off a cliff and fall down into the sea and die. 
which of course causes the pig's herds to run to the town and say, we've just tanked our economy. Actually, he did. And so the people rush out of the city and basically tell Jesus to go away. They don't want him around if this is what's going to happen when he's around. If our economy is going to tank when you are around, then we don't want you around. I don't know about you, but I've actually heard some of this stuff. Not back in the Bible times, but recently. As we listen to the pundits talk about our world economy these days, can you hear the same kinds of things being said? Can you hear the fact that if, if, if you know, depending upon God looks like that, then I don't want to depend on God. I'm going to, I'm going to depend on my own way of getting around, my own way of living. I think we need to be very, very careful as we go through the rest of COVID and into the recovery afterwards. I think we need to be looking very carefully at this reaction in this particular story where Jesus is trying to paint a picture to the people of his day of who he is and what he intends with all of humanity. The story ends in a very, very amazing way. The man who had been freed, this is verse 38 of chapter 8 of Luke, the man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with Jesus. But Jesus sent him home, my friends. Jesus didn't give him his heart's desire at that moment, saying, no, don't come with me. Go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went through all the town proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. My friends, this is an example, I believe, that we need to take very seriously. This is the result of coming in contact with Almighty God. This is the result of the uh, chains that are put around us of, of the evil empire being released and, and then individuals, ourselves included, being sent to tell other people about the difference between the kingdom of evil and the kingdom of God and what it is to live completely chained to the kingdom of evil completely oriented, as it were. Maybe, maybe we don't look bad, but as God sees people who are in this economy, He sees them exactly as this demoniac. He sees them as people who are enslaved. And, and it, it, right now, my mind is thinking of Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus says, upon this rock, myself, upon, I will build my church, and my church is going to be storming down the gates of hell. Why? Because there are captives in there. Because there are people trapped. Because there are people enslaved. And guess what? The Bible's very clear in that next sentence. The gates of hell will not be able to keep the church out. Isn't that good news? I think, that's, I think that's marvelous news. And we'll see why, because chapter 9 is coming, but not before we go through this next story, which is the story for today. On the other side of the lake, he leaves the man there to go about his evangelistic business. Jesus gets in the boat with his disciples, and he goes back across the lake, and he gets to shore where there are crowds of church people waiting to see him. In the midst of this crowd is the head elder, the president of the synagogue, the lead guy himself because he has a daughter. He has a 12-year-old daughter. Notice the number. It's very important. We're going to see it two more times in the next few uh, verses. He has a 12-year-old daughter who is very sick and potentially will die. He's been waiting. He's been waiting on the shore. 
He's being told, yes, Jesus is across the lake on the other side in the Gadarenes, but look, here comes his ship and, 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 and boat. And the disciples are now, maybe they've got the sails up, maybe they were rowing. They row back across the lake and there the crowds are and they're waiting for Jesus. As soon as Jesus steps off, there is Jairus on his knees in front of Jesus imploring him to come and heal his daughter. Now, it strikes me that all good stories, uh, maybe even all good sermons, kind of end up the way they start. If you remember, we started at the beginning of chapter 7 with the centurion asking Jesus to come and heal his servant. Did you notice the attitude of the centurion? I am not worthy. You don't even need to come to my house because I am not worthy. Where do we see Jairus? Where do we see the crowd? No, they are on the beach. They are looking at their timepieces, sundials, whatever. And they're saying, we've been waiting for you. What were you doing over there so long? We're, we, we've got business over here. We've got a young girl. And she needs your attention. You can, you can feel the impatience of this, this crowd of church people who are there to support their lead guy whose only daughter, the one who represents the in crowd, the one who, who represents the, the people, the, the, the good people. Remember, we talked about 12. Let's just cut to the chase and say, 12 is an important number in the Bible. It always represents the people of God. The people of God. And here you have a young lady who is 12 years old. She is representing the people of God. She is representing the church. And my friends, she is sick. And the people who have been around to support her, her parents, her loved ones, the people in the synagogue, they are worried that she is sick. And so they go to the only place that they know that they can get healing. My friends, if we look at the church today, we would probably be feeling the same way. Look at us in the midst of COVID here. We're having to do sermons by internet. We're having to do all kinds of things. We could say the church is sick. Uh, uh, people are not paying attention as much. People are, 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 are looking at other things out in the world and, and, and they're paying more attention to, to other things and not paying attention to God. We could say lots and lots of things concerning the church today. But suffice it to say, in this passage, we know that there's a 12-year-old girl and that she's sick and that her daddy wants Jesus to come and that he's impatient about Jesus coming and taking care of what he wants Jesus to take care of. I want you to see that there, that there is a concept here of who God is and what he's going to do for me and, 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 and when he should do it. There's an attitude here that I think we should take very close note of. But it's inside of this crowd. Incognito. Maybe dressed so that she wouldn't draw attention to herself. That another lady is present. As the crowd is pressing around Jesus. As the crowd is is. is anxiously moving Jesus along to his next most important appointment, which is the appointment that they want him to take uh, part in. She is there and gets in the train of this group, worms her way through the crowd, reaches down, hopefully without drawing attention to herself. She reaches down and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Now, my friends, <clears throat> again, as, as Chris and I have, have gone over this concept, it, it, it's just so beautiful. So I want you, to, want you to take that moment now where she has an electrifying experience, 
where she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. And the Bible says, immediately, not five seconds, but we're talking immediately, she is healed. What is she healed from? Well, the Bible just describes it as an issue of blood. Now, if we go back to the Levitical law, uh, uh, we, we find that when a woman was, was suffering from her monthly period, she was required to go outside of the camp. This woman had been living outside of her society for 12 years. Now, I don't think it's by mistake that on the one hand you have the in-girl who's 12 years old, whom everybody is worried about, and on the other side you have the out woman who is out because the law says that she cannot be in because she has an issue of blood. Oh, my friends, uh, the picture that is being painted here is, is of a, a world that Jesus, God, has come to save, to announce himself to, and in this, in this very moment, in the, the press of the crowd, he is going to explain to the whole group why he is here. Are you ready? Here we go. He stops, and he says, Somebody touched me. Peter voices what so many others had said, and he says, but Lord, uh, <clears throat> the, the whole crowd, <laughs> this version says, the whole crowd is pressing against you. My friends, <laughs> if we understand what Peter has just said, he is basically saying, the whole church, Jesus, is here because we want to be with you when you heal our girl. And Jesus stops the procession. <laughs> he stops the procession and he says, somebody touched me. Now, we sing that song, don't we? He touched me and made... Who? Okay. Maybe we're singing the song of the lady who touched him. But have you ever put yourself in Jesus' situation? That's what I want you to see in this progression that we have today. In Luke chapter 7 and Luke chapter 8, you have this progression where Jesus is trying to explain through all of these experiences who he is, why he is here, and what his uh, message is. Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. When the woman realized, this is verse 47, when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. And this is, this is Jesus' reaction right away. And, and I, it's so amazing. Daughter, daughter, do, do you realize the implications of that one word for this woman who had been outside for 12 years? He says, daughter. He reinstates the connection with one word, daughter, daughter. Your faith, your understanding, your trust, your your willingness to, to signal, because this is what she did, she reached out and she touched the hem. Remember Ruth? Ruth goes and lies at the feet of Boaz, and when he wakes up, she says, cover me with the corner, the tassels. Cover me with your wings. I've read this story so many times, and it's not until this particular study that I have realized that because of the, 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 the Hebrew and, and the, the connection between these, these words or these groups of words, that it also means that she reached out and she touched the edges of his wings. 
It's the wings, the hem, the skirts, as it were. And she is basically signaling God. She is coming to him and saying, I want to be under your wings. I want to be with you. Jesus knows this. Jesus recognizes this because you see, even while everyone else was jostling up against him, Peter is saying, everybody's squeezing up against you. They were not asking. Pains me to say. These good church people who were dragging Jesus off to take care of their precious 12-year-old daughter, which he wanted to do, They were not, not interested in him for who he really was. All they were interested in was what he could do for them. Imagine how Jesus feels when power, the Bible says, power has gone out of me. Somebody has connected to me, somebody has connected to me who knows who I am, who wants what I have to give, which is the healing between humans and God. And she receives it, not tomorrow, not a month later, but immediately, immediately. My friends, this this story could end right here and, and, and we could all go home and but it doesn't. Happily, I want you to know that that Jesus doesn't give up on the church people. The church people who, who wanted to rub up against him, but not really draw down on his power. He doesn't give up on them. He goes with them. And I, I'm imagining that she went along with. The crowd goes along to the, to the town, and Jesus then takes Peter, James, and John, and the mom and dad only clears out all of the weepers and wailers that probably had been hired to do so, goes into the bedroom of this little girl, this 12-year-old girl who has died, but whom he claims is not dead but is asleep. Now, do with that what you may. But what I'm going to tell you is that here you have this final picture specifically given to Peter, James, and John where Jesus wants them to know, I am the life giver. My purpose for coming to earth has been to take away all of the things that are between any human being and their life giver, to take, the, take those things away, to forgive those things, and to reconnect, to reconnect humanity with the life giver. So in that sense, you could see this 12-year-old girl representing the whole people of Israel, the whole 12 tribes of Israel that are dead in their understanding of God. And he says, no, they're not dead. I am the life giver. I will say when they're dead or not dead. They're just asleep. Laodicea, you might be asleep, but God has not given up on you. He grabs them, grabs them, he grabs her by the hand and says, Little girl, get up. I don't know about you, but I'm wanting that, that hand of God in my life. I'm, I'm wanting that, that belief that God has in me and, 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 and in this church and in people who are listening, people who are paying attention. I, I want him to reach down and grab a hold of us and say, get up, and for life to flow through us again. How do we know that she's alive? 
I think it's very interesting, and I, I did some extra study just to <laughs> make sure that what I was thinking was true. Jesus' next words to mom and dad, who are now hugging their now alive 12-year-old girl in front of Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, who are the only ones in the room, hey, give her something to eat. Why? Because you need to know this is not a ghost. This, this is not fake. The, 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 this is real. She is alive and she's hungry. She's been sick for a long time. She hasn't eaten. She needs something to eat. And what jumped into my head, what probably jumps into your head right away, is the fact that when Jesus visits his disciples, when one moment he's not in the room and the next moment he appears in the room... This is in Luke as well. What does he say? Hey, you got something to eat? He's been dead since Friday night. He's been in the tomb. This now is later. He hasn't eaten. Does he need to eat? He's the resurrected Lord. No, he doesn't need to eat. But he asks them, do you have something to eat? because he wants to show them, I'm real. I'm real. This is, this is not fake. This is not something you can explain away by some scientific theory. I am real. I am going to eat right here in your presence. And, and I, I know the, the vegetarians and vegans amongst us really don't like the fact that he ate some broiled fish. <laughs> God of creation, eating one of his own fish. Okay, so he ate fish. Let's not, let's not let that put us off Jesus, okay? But the fact is he ate because he wanted to show this is, this is me. This is the one who came, who, who invested in humanity. All through this progression, he has wanted to say just one thing. I have come that you may have life. I have come that you may be back together with the life giver. I'm going to take away everything. I'm going to take away everything that is separating you from the God of heaven, and we're going to forgive. We're going to weld you back together in relationship. After eight comes nine. And, and yes, the chapter differentiations were not there when Luke wrote this. But what comes next, my friend, is the call that comes today. As a result of these two studies that we've done, one on, on, on Ruth, the book of Ruth, which for me now has just absolutely exploded as far as the gospel is concerned. Now comes this story, this progression in Luke, where Jesus is preparing his disciples to go. And what is the message that they're going to tell? Well, they're going to tell about all the things that we have just read about, all the things that Jesus has, ha has just done, because they are going to have the opportunity to carry on his ministry. So you see right here in the beginning of the, the, the ninth chapter of Luke that it is, it is now that Jesus sends out the twelve. There's the last of the, the three twelves that I told you would be here. A 12-year-old girl, a, a woman that is outside for 12 years because of an issue of blood, and she is brought back, she is reconnected. All of this is being preparation for the 12 disciples, for the people to then know this is why God came. This is who God is. This is what He wants with humanity. Go out and tell people about this God. So they began their circuit, the Bible says in 9 verse 6 of the villages, preaching the good news and doing what? Healing the sick. My friends, healing comes in so many different ways. We've seen that throughout these stories, this progression of Luke chapter 7 and 8, and we now know that it was in preparation for his disciples to go out and do the same in his power, in his strength, 
saying the same things. The good news, my friends, is this. This is why I've been so excited about sharing this with you. I hope it brings you uh, encouragement, joy, happiness. I hope you uh, uh, go back and read and reread these stories because what's going to jump out at you will be even more than what I have uh, told you today. Please read them again for yourselves and see what it is that Jesus is wanting to, to have happen in our lives because indeed we are his modern day disciples and we need to know what the good news is and to be able to share that with our friends and our families. Thank you so much for being with me in this and I would just uh, crave one more time to pray with you. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jesus, for coming and representing God to us here on earth. You are amazing. You are wonderful. We praise you. We honor you. And we just ask that you would give us again more and more visions of who you are and what it is that you came to do when you were here. And that this good news, that it was not just for your time or your people, is for everybody who is estranged from you, everybody who is captive to sin, everybody who the evil empire has ripped and stripped. Lord, you have, you have come so that they may be reconnected and be part of your kingdom, not just in the sweet by and by, which we're looking for and longing for. Oh, we certainly are. But Lord, we are, we are praying that we will see these kinds of miracles. We will see these kinds of actions happen in our lives, in our time. Even for those who are suffering from COVID now, God, please heal our friends, our loved ones. Heal those who have been far from you and that COVID is giving a, an opportunity to reconsider. Please, God, give us the opportunity to spread this good news far and wide, we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, we'll see you again next week. Uh, uh, we're going to work on our uh, computer glitches and we're going to uh, work to be able to bring you a full program next week. Uh, in the meantime, just know that there are a number of resources that you can access on our website. Uh, go there to santaclaritasda.org, not only for what you can get, but also for what you can give. You can connect yourself to Adventist Giving online via our website, and you can continue the faithfulness. I just want to say this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this congregation is faithful. The numbers show that. And for those of you who have continued to be faithful in this time through Adventist giving or by dropping by uh, after church or during church, we want to just thank you because the ministry and the mission need to continue going forward. And we are thankful that you're willing to uh, participate as partners with Jesus in this ministry. God bless you this week. Again, if you have any needs, please call the office and we will get to whatever you need right away. God bless you. Amen.